All right. Uh, in this next lecture, uh, we'll talk. We'll, we'll continue our discussion about siliciclastic environments with a, a discussion about rivers. Uh, so, rivers make up uh, a significant portion of, or or river corridors at least make up a significant portion of the the land surface of Earth and. And sort of intuitively, they also make up a significant uh, component of the terrestrial stratigraphic record because of that. Uh, so they're they're relatively important, and, and there's a lot of detail involved in the understanding of river stratigraphy. So I kind of want to give an overview of sort of the the river sediment transporting processes, uh, river dynamics, and how those might result in some key facies uh, and key identifiers of, of river systems. So uh, as we mentioned in the last lecture, uh, rivers uh, are um, flowing bodies of water uh, that form corridors. I apologize, my dog is making chewing noises in the background. Um, again, it comes from the Latin to flow uh, as opposed to uh, wash against, which is the term for alluvial. Uh, and Rivers have a variety of plan forms, but in general are, you know, um, more or less linear-ish corridors uh, to route flow and sediment from some upland region to some sink, uh, whether that sink be a, a you know, a, a, an ocean or a lake or another river or something along those lines. Uh, we can describe rivers in terms of their plan form, they exhibit a range of plan form morphologies that uh, um, depend on, on a number of different parameters, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. Uh, but generally speaking, we can divide rivers up uh, along these sort of various end member scenarios of whether they are relatively straight in their channel plan form uh, or whether they are sinuous versus whether they have single threads or multiple threads to the river. And so if they have multiple threads, we would refer to them as braided or anastomosed. Uh, and if they have single threads, we would refer to them as straight or meandering. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and generally speaking, those are, those are the terms that you'll most likely hear in terms of describing a river plan for morphology. Uh, we can kind of define these a little bit further uh, when we talk about sinuous crested or, or, or sinuous river channels. Uh, we refer to a, a sinuosity uh, term, which is a mathematically uh, defined term here, which is basically the river length divided by the valley length. So if you were to trace down the middle of the channel here on this river, right you could come up with the length of the actual river channel and divide that by the length of the valley right so the river channel because it's meandering will be longer than the valley that it flows through right so over some number of meanders you would measure the length of the valley and if your sinuosity index is greater than about 1.5 so the river is about one and a half times the length of the valley you would kind of consider that to be a uh, a sinuous or a meandering river, right? Uh, with multi-threaded rivers, again, we talked about braided rivers. Those generally refer to ones that, while they do have a straighter plan form, they also tend to have unvegetated bars versus anastomosing rivers where the bars are stabilized by, by vegetation. Okay, so that's the key distinction there from, a, from an actual morphologic standpoint, is the vegetation stabilizing the bars in braided versus anastomosing. Okay, and the reason that braiding uh, versus anastomosing results in more straight versus more sinuous crested is because, in part, that vegetation, by virtue of the fact that it stabilizes the bars in the banks, can result or allow those, uh, those meanders to form. And we can think about this uh, in terms of the controls on the channel form or channel morphology uh, generally have, have something to do with the sediment supply, right, and the channel stability. Those two things can be interlinked, although not exactly. And the channel slope or gradient here uh, and the sediment size, okay? So I won't go into a ton of detail on this, but suffice it to say, 
as you end up with finer, more stable channels. You end up with either more meandering or anastomose plan forms. Uh, and as you go from lower to higher sediment supply relative to, to the water supply, uh, you, you, you move towards the more multi-threaded systems like braided or anastomosing channels, okay? Um, so that's just sort of a general uh, overview of, of what are the controls on that. And channel stability, as I mentioned, is, a, is an interesting one. It can be a result of a number of different factors, including uh, the, the material that the floodplain or the banks are made up of. Are they made of mud? Are they stabilized by, say, permafrost? We talked a little bit about that in our discussion session today. Um, uh, but one of the key drivers uh, that we think controls the uh, ability of a channel to form these meandering forms is, is vegetation. Uh, so here's some really cool experiments that were done uh, where they seeded uh, an experimental river with alfalfa sprouts and allowed that to grow over uh, a long period of time and had flood cycles that allowed sort of overbank deposition to help move sediment around and stabilize and build up those floodplains. We found that as you transition from an unvegetated to a vegetated reach, uh, you move from a multi-threaded braided river system to a more single threaded meandering. You can see some nice, nice meanders here developing. Uh, that is not the only way that you can build uh, meandering rivers, but it is one of the ways in which you can create that channel stability or the, uh, the, the bank stability that allows it to build those meanders. That's the key feature um, that allows those meanders to form. Uh, so we can talk a little bit about braided rivers. Uh, braided rivers are, are, are characterized predominantly by a high amount of bed load in transport. Here's a great experiment. Uh, showing some of those. We talked a little bit about braided systems kind of in, in, in the alluvial fan lecture, but you can see here uh, the, with these dye injections in this experiment, um, let's see if we can make it go again. Uh, you can see that at any given time on these braided systems, there's multiple channels that are active uh, in distributing uh, water across the, the valley here. Uh, because of the uh, high amounts of sediment load uh, and the low channels uh, or the low bank stability, you end up with erodible banks that allow the channels to develop wider and shallower, i.e. a higher width to depth ratio, right? Um, and that's characteristic of, of channels that are uh, that are depositing sediment rapidly, okay? Uh, these often form in systems where you have highly variable discharge, whether those are glacial, you know, proglacial environments, desert environments, and so forth. And, and, and so because of all of those conditions, they result in, in, in extremely dynamic channel behavior. The channels are, are, are migrating and switching and avulsing and bars are moving all the time. Okay. Uh, there's some, here's some really beautiful images of these braided river systems. Again, you can see uh, these are all in New Zealand. Uh, just because they happen to have spectacular ones uh, where you know, these glacier-fed river systems are just pumping out tons and tons of, of coarse sediment supply uh, so that, that you have high bed load uh, sediment and transport. You can see in these systems you're, you're in, often in fruit critical uh, conditions. You can see these standing wave trains here that would be um, over anti-dunes right? So that would indicate that you're in fruit conditions above one in this river system. Same thing, you can kind of see it here uh, as well. So uh, you can really see the dynamic um, multi-thread behavior of this, uh, of, of these river systems here in this, in these images. Uh, here's another example of a braided river from uh, Nebraska. This is, uh, I believe this is the North Platte River in Nebraska, and you can see that Although it doesn't look quite the same as those previous images where all the bars uh, were exposed, in this case the bars are submerged, but you still have multiple threaded, uh, deeper parts of the of the reach here with uh, mid-channel bars throughout the river. So in most parts of this river, you have at least two threads of the river, oftentimes more, 
And again, this is because there's a high uh, quantity of bed load in transport in this river system. This river uh, emanates from the sand hills in Nebraska, which are old Pleistocene Aeolian dune deposits, windblown dune deposits. And so it's, it's got a ton of sand in transport that's available for it to move. Uh, here's some other great images, again, from that experiment. Uh, sa same, uh, um, same researcher's experiment tank here. So these are relatively easy to produce in a lab again because of the the lack of cohesion and the high sediment supply rates that we can produce in the lab they're very easy to do um, but here's another image from uh, the uh, Sisquak River in California as well <clears throat> and so we can start to think about what kinds of sediment uh, deposits you might expect from a braided river uh, and start to think about our facies model here uh, Typically, you'll see evidence for upper flow regime uh, uh, dynamics here. So uh, that would include plain beds, potentially, although it's very rare. I have seen it uh, um, upstream pointing, cross bedding, this very shallow angle from uh, anti-dunes. That's very uncommon to see, but it, it does exist. You may also see your know, trough cross bedding, uh, cross bedding from sort of larger scale uh, um, dunes and bars. Uh, many braided stream deposits will be coarse grained, uh, you know, coarse sand, gravel uh, related uh, deposits. And, and there will be sort of a, you know, a superimposed, um, you know, finding upward sequence, but you may not expect to see, you know, a significant amount of cross bedded, uh, you know, uh, ripple laminated sands or anything like that. You may, you may be more likely to be in much more sandy deposits less mud as you as as you're likely to have less uh preservation of floodplain if if at all deposited right um so you're typically going to be in coarser sandy gravelly uh, material in a, in a braided river system right and there's a number of uh of models for for these facies uh um for, for braided river facies, depending on the types of bars that you might expect to see, whether you're in longitudinal bars, those that are um, uh, lengthwise in the channel versus transverse bars that go across the channel and so forth. Uh, but, but these are some of the facies successions that you might expect to see in, in these uh, sand bedded rivers, depending on, or, or in these uh, braided rivers, apologies, uh, depending on the types of uh, uh, of features that are present and we won't go into too much detail on these but but typically they will exhibit features of flashy discharge multiple generations of bars going over other bars going over other bars and so forth um, uh, here's a here's a nice example of this from from a, a highway outcrop in in utah uh, just above moab that's that's me for scale although i guess if, if we haven't had in-person classes, so I'm not a very useful scale because you've only seen this part of me, but uh, um, I'm, I'm six feet tall, if that helps. Uh, these are, so these are some nice mid-channel bars. Uh, these would have been, uh, you know, transverse bars in all likelihood that were migrating downstream. So you can see the cross bedding at the large, you know, meter scale cross bedding. Very small amount of floodplain muds deposited here, mostly large scale trough, uh, uh, cross bedded sands, some, some planar uh, bedded sands uh, that maybe have some, some cross bedding at their base, right? Uh, so, so this is a relatively common sandy bar uh, braided river deposit. Here's a, a larger view of that uh, same outcrop here. Uh, and you can see again, it's predominantly sand uh, with maybe a little bit of floodplain deposits, but not that much, right? You can see sort of the scale of some of these, these bar cross bedding here, uh, is, you know, on the order of anywhere from two to six feet, maybe more, uh, you know, one to two meters, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. Uh, here's another, another image from the same formation. This is all, uh, from the Jurassic Kayenta formation in, uh, uh, that that's exposed throughout the Colorado Plateau region. It's something that I did my dissertation field work on and Again, you can see sort of these large-scale uh, Cross bedding that are associated with uh, in-channel bars here. You can see their compound bars. There's 
you know, this bar that was then cut by this bar, which had cut this bar, and so on and so forth. So indicating that there was a lot of significant movement of, of these bar scale features in the stratigraphy. And very little floodplain, you know, uh, mud deposits here that, that of, of any appreciable amount. Um, very, very infrequent in these deposits. Okay. Uh, so then we can go to anastomosing rivers, sort of the next uh, step in the process here. And these often have vegetation, as I mentioned, that stabilize the bars. And so uh, the, those bars will be more stable relative to braided streams. These typically have lower gradients than braided streams, just like we talked about with alluvial fans. The higher the sediment load, the more the river is dumping out sediment, the steeper that slope is going to be. Um, and... Uh, in general, these, these river systems have banks that are comprised of cohesive sediment that are deposited by suspended load as the floods you know, inundate the banks. The, the, the vegetation on the banks and on the bars is able to baffle that flow and slow it down enough so that fine grained sediment can deposit out the clays and muds that allow those banks to become more stable. Um, so that's, that's a relatively common feature in anastomosing rivers. Um, here's here's an example, like I say, with many things in sedimentology, stratigraphy, and geomorphology is that uh, um, we like to talk about end members, but most many systems are are in transition between those. So here's an image, um, funny enough, named the Halfway River that is halfway between a braided and an anastomosing river here. So you can see the trees vegetating and stabilizing some of the bars, but much of the bars are still also... Uh, unvegetated. So these are active bars that are migrating relatively regularly, whereas these might be more stable on the, you know, decades to, mul to, to hundreds of years timescales. Um, here's uh, possibly one of the prettiest rivers, I think, in the world. It's uh, This is an anastomosing river, the uh, Saskatchewan River in Canada. Um, again, you can see the, the interconnected channels uh, that are uh, surrounding these these bars that are almost entirely vegetated in this case. But even though they have vegetation, uh, depending on the location and the climate and the sediment supply and so forth, these can still be really dynamic systems. This is a uh, an anastomosing river in uh, in Bangladesh, the Padma River, and this is a, uh, I believe this is about a 35 year time lapse from satellite imagery. Uh, and you can see that over that relatively short period of time it's still incredibly dynamic and uh, if, if you were to go look at a Google Earth image of this all of these bars get vegetated almost immediately and in fact you can see it in the imagery the white the very bright parts are the uh, um, sediment that's still exposed sand whereas everything else is vegetated and you can see even you know on the order of a couple of years the vegetation grows on these bars just because of the climate and vegetation regime there is, is uh, so conducive to, to, to shrubs growing, or vegetables growing, I guess. <laughs> vegetation growing, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, it's a little bit difficult to, to sort of uh, tease out the differences in facies between, you know, anastomosing versus braided versus meandering because they're kind of in that sort of... Um, transition in between and so so I'm not going to go into specifics here about their faces but but note that it, it, it's not the easiest thing to to tease out from the stratigraphic record if you're looking at an anastomosing river versus say a meandering river I should say um, you may be lucky enough to see the types of you know mid-channel bars and things preserved but it, but it's not that uh, straightforward I should say uh, so then we can move on to meandering rivers. Uh, here in Louisiana, we're, we're pretty used to seeing meandering rivers. These are single-threaded, stable channel configurations where the channels meander across their floodplain. Uh, they meander due to erosion along the outer bank and deposition along the inner point bars. Uh, so you get deposition here on the point bar that is coupled with erosion on the outer bank that results in the channel moving in the in the lateral dimension until it gets to a point where it cuts off uh, and and that process begins again uh, we happen to live on on one of the more spectacular meandering rivers of the world here on the mississippi river if you've ever flown out of uh, 
the New Orleans airport, you've surely seen the beautiful meanders um, uh, of the Mississippi River. And uh, as they, they migrate and meander, they leave behind a stratigraphy or a stratigraphic record on the floodplain here. And you can see that very clearly in this beautiful black and white image. Um, I don't recall actually which river I snagged this from, uh, but you can see as each generation of the uh, point bar uh, migrates laterally, you get sort of a, um, a scroll here that's deposited. Uh, so we would refer to those as scroll bar deposits. You can see these really beautifully in a lot of aerial imagery, also in a lot of uh, LIDAR imagery as well. And this results in a process called lateral accretion that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, here's another great example of that just because it's uh, near and dear to my heart. This is the Laramie River in Laramie, Wyoming, where I, where I did my PhD. And, and again, you can see in, in this river, it's a relatively small meandering river, um, fairly low sediment loads, uh, and, and, and relatively uh, um, stable channel configuration through much of its reach. And you can see because of the vegetation here how, how the old uh, floodplain is almost entirely comprised uh, of old meanders from this river, right? So it's most, much of the floodplain itself shows at least evidence that at some point in the past there were old meander bars deposited there. Even in locations where the channel no longer exists, you can see these nice little little um, cuspate looking lakes here. Um, so when a, when a channel cuts off here, you see this these little lakes left behind, and those are called oxbow lakes. We'll talk a little bit about those as well. Uh, but as these channels migrate, uh, and as the bars move across the floodplain, you end up with uh, a lateral migration. Um, and, and that leaves behind this stratigraphic record. Here's some, some great time-lapse imagery. It's being a little slow on my computer. I'm gonna maybe pause this one and try and just get this one to go. You can see that as this one migrates, let's see if we can track a bar here. You can see it's gonna leave behind sediment as a result of that point bar deposition. And that sediment gets left behind in the stratigraphic record, especially if the river doesn't come back and re-erode it at some later time. Um, let me see if I can play this one for you because this one has some really beautiful ones. Uh, it doesn't seem to want to play in a normal way. Um, but you can sort of see the, the, the scrolls again being deposited here on the floodplain. This also occurs in, you know, in braided river systems as well to an extent where you do get lateral migration. And so you may see similar looking facies associated with that, although with less floodplain material. Uh, this is a, a more braided river system that still exhibits lateral migration. Uh, this is in Tibet. Uh, once again, we live in a very spectacular example of this, and this is a great map that was produced by, uh, um, by Harold Fisk, uh, sort of in the early part of the, the last century. And he did all of this work by hand using aerial imagery and on the ground measurements. Uh, looking at the ancient Mississippi River uh, um, meanders, relative ages of each one, basically looking at how they overlap, which ones cut over the other ones, to look at every generation of, uh, of meander position of the river. And you can do this from, from the geomorphic uh, um, side of things by just looking at the floodplain can also see similar things as these things get preserved in stratigraphy. You can slice through them in a sense by using, for example, seismic data. So this is a 3D seismic volume uh, that I processed uh, from uh, off the coast of New Zealand. And you can see that what's going on here is you're taking horizontal, what are called horizon slices, through the seismic volume of the stratigraphy. This is offshore you know, thousands of feet deep, but you can see uh, um, the meanders of this of these uh, ancient rivers that had deposited uh, point bar sequences that you can kind of scroll through here. You can start to see it here. See, there's a meander, there's a meander. You can see the old scrolls um, all deposited in this ancient stratigraphy. So that's a relatively cool thing to see in, uh, in, in the stratigraphic record. And it's, it's quite a common architectural element, we call that, a, a, a meander 
Uh, a point bar sequence is a, is a very common architectural element, a, a component of stratigraphic sequences that gets preserved. Okay? It's, it's some part of the landscape that is a highly depositional location on the landscape and often leaves behind a record such that much of the Earth's terrestrial or, or land-based stratigraphic record is comprised of these types of deposits. Okay? And so what that looks like in stratigraphy from the uh, you know, side view, uh, which is often what you see in, a, in, a, um, in an outcrop, is, is this. So you get what are called lateral accretion sets. And so as the bars migrate towards the outer bank, right, uh, you get incision along the cut bank and deposition along the point bar. Okay, so here's the cut bank. It's typically a little bit steeper. And then here's the point bar, which is a more gradual slope here. Um, so this is the depositional side. This would be here, for example, on this image. And this is the erosional side, which would be here, the cut bank on this image. Okay. And as the channel migrates this direction towards these houses here that are going to fall into the river, uh, or those houses there that are going to fall into the river, uh, <laughs> not to be uh, crass about that sort of thing, uh, you end up depositing laterally new point bars and eroding new cut bank as the channel migrates laterally, right? And you continue this process, continue this process, and ultimately you end up with a sequence that'll look something like this, left in stratigraphy, where you have these sigmoidal shaped uh, lateral accretion sets, right? These point bar deposits that form this package of cross-bedded sediment, and then you end up potentially with a plug or a fill that gets left behind as that channel may be avulsed and abandoned or cut off and went somewhere else, then you fill in with finer material or something like that. So this is a very, very common architecture to see of varying lengths depending on how far a channel migrates across the floodplain before it avulses or cuts off, okay? So here's a great video of, of a model of this kind of, of process here. Of a, here's a river that is numerically meandering across a landscape here. Uh, this is a Python model by a, a colleague at, at Texas um, Bureau of Economic Geology, Zoltan Sylvester, who you'll notice a lot of his beautiful photographs throughout my lectures because he's a great photographer as well. But here's a, a river that meanders and the meander wavelength is increasing and you can see as it's meandering this sort of uh, deposits that get left behind are those sigmoidal shapes in the cross stream di direction. And then you get these sort of downstream oriented, uh, less steep inclined surfaces in the downstream direction as well. Okay. Um, and you might note that one thing that occurs is as you have finer material deposited on the top of the bars and coarser materials down at the base of the bar because you have a deeper depth and more ability to transport sediment down here at the base than you do at the top, you end up with a, each of these bar sequences fines upwards, right? So as you go from here upwards, uh, up the bar, I'd say in this direction, you get finer and finer material, okay? And what this looks like an outcrop is this. So these are lateral accretion sets. You can see the cross bedding here. Uh, so they're all dipping off to the left here. And you can see that there's the coarse sand at the base. And then you have less and less sand, more and more mud as you go up towards the top of these bars. Okay. So you can see these are sort of the, maybe uh, this is the same image, but just annotated with some of the, you know, dipping um, bar clinoforms, we call them. They are uh, um, uh, inclined strata uh, that 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 form those point bar uh, faces. Okay, and again, note that the grain size finds upwards in each of these sequences. So you have coarser sand at the base, and then you get finer. Uh, here's some other great images of this. Uh, these are from nearby that that other location from Hanksville, Utah. Uh, again, sandy deposits finding upwards into muddier deposits. All of this is inclined strata dipping off towards the, the right in this case. So these would be those point bar sequences that were laterally accreting from this 
side of the image down to that side of the image, indicating that the point bar was kind of migrating in that direction. And then overlaying that, in this case, you have floodplain muds, right? So as you abandoned that channel and kept aggrading the system, you built in, uh, you, you, you deposited and preserved a point bar meander sequence, a lateral accretion set, uh, and, and put floodplain muds on top as the river moved off somewhere else and as it periodically would flood and you build up with uh, sediment over those, uh, up with fine sediment here. Okay, so you might expect to see soil horizons and things like that, root casts and things of that nature in these upper deposits. Okay. Here's another example of what that might look like. These are uh, lateral accretion sets kind of from a weird oblique view, uh, but a very beautiful outcrop in, uh, f of the Ferris Formation in Wyoming. This was taken from uh, um, a boat on uh, uh, Seminole Reservoir. And, and again, you can see sort of the, uh, you know, more fine materials, you go upwards in the section. This is a little bit of a, a complicated uh, outcrop, but you can see multiple generations of these channels. Um, this is the Cretaceous Ferris Formation in Wyoming. And here's another image from down the road of that. And again, this entire outcrop, the upper portion of it was all, is all these, uh, um, it's much coarser material, but all of these dipping uh, lateral accretion surfaces here. Okay. Here's another great example of that from a, a bar in the Kayanta Formation. Again, uh, you know, getting into a, a, an interesting point, which is sometimes that it's, it can be difficult to tell whether you're dealing with a, a, a meandering point bar or a mid-channel bar. And uh, one of the kind of, um, kind of joking comments that, uh, this fellow here who uh, was a, he, he passed away, but he was a professor at the University of Wyoming, he used to make that you uh, put three stratigraphers in front of a, uh, a fluvial outcrop and you get five different uh, opinions. So you could argue whether this was a lateral accreting point bar or whether this was an accreting mid-channel bar, but uh, you can see that there's fine grain material in there that would lead me to believe that it was a, a point bar. Um, one kind of cool thing about uh, bar sequences that you might see preserved in stratigraphy that might indicate the scale of your of your uh, varying features, because as you recall, we talked a little bit about uh, how uh, sometimes in stratigraphy you end up with deposits that could be two different things, right? And and the same can be said for bars versus dunes, because there are dunes that are as big as you know, th there might be a dune at the bottom of the Mississippi River that's five times the size of the bar that's at the bottom of, or, or that makes up the channel in the Niobrara River, for example. Uh, and, and so sometimes it can be difficult without extra context to know whether you're looking at a bar form cross stratification or bed form or dune cross stratification, right? Just on their size alone can't tell you that. So one kind of neat thing to see sometimes is often there are dunes that climb up the backs of these bars and so sometimes you can see dune scale cross stratification preserved inside the bar scale cross stratification. Um, so this is an image, uh, I believe this was in your lab here uh, from last week, uh, if my memory is serving me correctly. Uh, time seems to stand still and, and fly at the same time in these COVID days. but. Uh, you can see these dunes that are climbing up the backs of these bars. And so that might be one of the pieces of context that you might see is preserved in stratigraphy to tell you whether you're dealing with, are your bars this big and your dunes this big? Or are your dunes this big and your bars are so big you can't see them in the outcrop, for example. Uh, and here's a great example of that from the Kayenta Formation again in, uh, in, in um, this is in Colorado National Monument. And Here's a nice sigmoidal cross strata piece. Um, there's some, if you go to this link here, uh, it, it takes you to a website called Sketchfab where I've put a 3D model of this outcrop that I've created that you can scroll around and see things in a little bit more detail. It's actually super fun to click on those and, and peruse around. And there's a bunch, there's dozens more that I have in there and some of your labs would be in there. But you can see that if you zoom in on this outcrop, you can kind of start to see it here. 
But if you if you really zoom in, you can start to see smaller scale cross bedding preserved and actually climb and, and, and inclined up the face of this particular piece of um, uh, of this larger cross set. And that would indicate to me that you have bars that are climbing up the front of this dune or, or, or uh, <laughs> dunes that are climbing up this bar. Uh, leading me to believe that this is bar scale cross stratification and that's the dune scale cross stratification. So maybe, you know, the bar was three, two or three meters high and the dunes were, you know, the cross beds for the dunes are maybe only five to ten centimeters high, which would tell you that they're, the dunes themselves were about two to three times that height. Okay. Um, so, so that's an interesting piece of context. It's not super common to see, but you do see that. There are some other facies that can be associated with rivers, but not necessarily inside the river channel itself. Uh, you can get sedimentation that occurs over bank. Uh, so as a river rises above its uh, uh, bankful depth, it can uh, spill over its, uh, it, its margins and you can get uh, uh, deposits that form along the edge of the river. And because of the fact that as the the when the water increases its height there's a bunch of suspended sand and so forth once that spills out over onto the floodplain it rapidly can decelerate right so if you if the flow reaches a point where it's over the you know over the banks of the river and onto the floodplain you end up with much slower moving water on the floodplain and so the sediment rapidly deposits very proximal to the channel margin when that happens. And you can see that here where all of this white material is sand that was deposited over bank during a 1993 flood on the Mississippi River. And, you, and over time what happens is this accumulation of sand proximal to the river uh, builds up natural levees where, uh, where the, the, the elevation is highest closest to the river and gently slopes back down towards the floodplain. If you live in New Orleans, you know a lot about natural levees because we all, uh, our, our flood insurance rates and whether our streets flood is often dependent upon the natural levee. So if you go out towards uh, um, the French Quarter, uptown, that area, um, you're, you're at a much higher elevation relative to say where I live in mid city or UNO uh, as the, the, the topography slopes away from the river and the, you know, uh, the elevation at, uh, in, in some parts of the French Quarter is maybe you know, uh, uh, 17 or 18 feet above sea level, whereas I'm at you know, three feet or two feet because of that. Um, and, and, and so those natural levees here on the Mississippi River can be on the order of 16, 18 feet tall, uh, which is a pretty neat feature. Um, uh, you can see it a lot in uh, river systems when they flood and, 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 and you see like certain, just the little strips of land exposed uh, as, as natural levees. It's another uh, component that leaves behind the high topography here after the river has been abandoned and, and a volster changed its course. You get uh, um, uh, many of the, the both like road and transportation corridors, but also the uh, the settlements in, in, in Louisiana were built on these natural levees of old river courses. So if there's a bayou, that would be like the old course of the river. And then there's high topography with all the, the houses and farms and the highway along that uh, in a lot of places in Louisiana. That's, uh, those are the old river uh, um, natural levees. Esplanade Ridge here in town is, is one of those old natural levees, for example. Um, it's the high topography where the river used to be. Okay. <clears throat> Gentilly Ridge as well. Um, so sometimes you can get really beautiful deposits where the river actually bursts through those natural levees. Now in this particular image, this is not a natural levee that's being burst through. It's, a, it's an artificial uh, levee that's being burst through. And you get these kind of like almost little deltas uh, that form in the floodplain because the river broke through its levee and, and built out a delta. This is, uh, you know, there, there would have been one of these at uh, um, Bonacary where, uh, where the spillway is now, it used to be a place where the, where the sp 
crevasse splay used to happen relatively frequently. There's actually a cool um, newspaper image from, I can't remember the year, 18, 1820 something, I want to say, in the department uh, that shows, a, it, it's like an, a painting that was turned into a, a printed image of a crevasse splay occurring there on the natural levee. Uh, so here, here's an example of that, and it forms these little deltas out into the floodplain that have uh, some really interesting features. And so you might see these preserved in the rock record uh, as well as these coarse, sandy, deltaic-looking deposits on top of a muddy floodplain that kind of tells you that you might be in a crevasse splay. Here's another great example of, of, of one of these uh, uh, from Google Earth imagery. And you often find them associated... Uh, they're relatively common to see on the outer banks, right, where the shear stresses are higher because the river uh, is, um, it, you know, the momentum is such that you have higher elevations going along the outer bank because of the, the centrifugal force, which drives a slightly higher um, water surface elevation or increases the slope away from the point bar and towards the outer bank. Uh, as the flow is kind of getting slingshotted around this this bend, um, and so you often see these splays occurring on the outer banks of of the rivers, and so this is a relatively common feature to see that way. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned a little bit, uh, we won't go into too much on this, but uh, you can sort of see uh, the um, the abandoned channels and the old riv river levees. Uh, these are some transects um, here that, that show some of those elevations across these, these old abandoned channels. And you can see that the, the heights of the levees are often almost as deep sometimes as the river channel itself. Uh, and, and this is actually a, a leads us to a, a relatively important uh, phenomenon that occurs, and that is the controls on channel avulsion are generally derived from these levy uh, height uh, requirements or the, 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 the setup of the heights of the levees. And what happens uh, is as a channel continually builds up its levees, floods out onto the floodplain, does its thing over multiple flood cycles, what happens is the levees build up, and if you're in an aggradational system or a depositional system, the bed of the river is, is, is also aggrading, right? And so eventually what happens is the entire river channel itself ends up elevated above the floodplain, such that the bottom of the river is higher than the floodplain off some distance away, you know, a kilometer away or something. And that sets up a very unstable condition for a channel where if the flow depth is uh, is about the same as the super elevation, right, or becomes less than the super elevation, which means that the, the channel, you know, the levee tops, th this sets up a condition where this equals one is where the flow depth is equal to the distance between the, the, the um, floodplain elevation and the tops of the levees, right? So if the flow depth is smaller than that number, right, then the base of the channel is now above the floodplain, essentially. This is kind of how you measure it. Uh, when you get into that super elevation condition, the channel becomes unstable. And so what can happen is you get avulsions, right? So if you can imagine as you reach that location or that, that condition, then maybe you get a, a flood one year and you get a crevasse splay that forms that breaks through that levee. Now it's no longer like only breaking through the levee up to a certain, you know, maybe the river is 20 meters deep and the floodplain is only two meters uh, um, below the top of the levee. Then only the two meters worth of that flow can get out there. And then when the flow recedes, the river is back in its normal channel, right? But if the river is 10 meters deep and the floodplain is 11 meters below the tops of the levee, now when that crevasse splay happens, the whole river can just go that way because that's lower now than the bed of the river, 
just so you, if you kind of see what happens that how that sets up so this can result in uh, large-scale or catastrophic avulsions so for an example here's uh, here's from the Niobrara in a river in Nebraska which is a relatively high sediment flux river um, you can see uh, in, in this first image from 1993 uh, you get uh, you, you have you know there's your overbank uh, here these are the the floodplains here there's a canal off on this side so so that provides kind of the low point of the floodplain if you will is this canal and so a flood comes through in 1999 and it uh, it, it, it evolves the channel to uh, off to that way and it split it into two channels basically and then eventually because this part of the floodplain was lower than this the, than the bed of this river it took over right decided that it was energetically more favorable to go towards that steeper path right because that's how floodplain avulsion occurs right um there's i'm trying to think of some some really great examples of that uh occurring over human time scales oftentimes in rivers like the mississippi river that occurs over hundreds or thousands of year time scales but um and, and it certainly occurs often in deltas and we'll talk a lot more about it when we talk about uh um deltas but uh some rivers that have really high sediment load like the yellow river in china uh actually experience uh, super elevation and avulsion on like 50 year time scales and um, that's actually one of the uh, um, probably that channels super elevation and avulsion problem if you will the fact that it does it so often is is potentially over long time scales maybe the deadliest natural phenomenon in earth's history um, it, it has it has killed hundreds of thousands of people many times over because so many people live on that river's floodplain because it produces so much sediment and every time it floods over the floodplain it dumps that beautiful fertile silt out onto the floodplain which is fantastic farming uh, and that river corridor is a is a you know a big booming shipping corridor and and commerce corridor so much of a significant portion of the population lives there and then every 50 years it evolves and floods somewhere else and, and can be catastrophic um, so uh, there's some some really interesting and terrifying uh, uh articles that you can read about uh, you know the uh, the yellow river or Huanghe river in china if you're ever interested in, in reading about evolutions and, and how scary they can be <laughs> um, uh, and so what this results in from a stratigraphic standpoint is you end up with uh, an architecture that preserves some of these features such as a channel fill deposit that might be isolated and surrounded by floodplain that you might see you know the floodplain muds and paleosols and so forth and then you see these uh the channel here this would be the channel body that doesn't necessarily represent the actual shape of an old channel but some composite shape of where that channel may have migrated around to and then you see these wings of sediment of coarser sand these might have been the levee and overbank splay deposits right uh that could have uh spilled out over the levees at some point and now you can see that it's at some point had been abandoned and that abandonment likely occurred uh, when an avulsion happened and that this may have been at least some part of this channel body here may have been the actual river channel when that happened and then after the abandonment occurred then it filled in with uh, with fill deposits okay <clears throat> uh, this can look fairly characteristically um, interesting here uh, so you can start to see here is here may have been the actual you know at one point in time this was the channel depth right and you would see these uh, sigmoidal clinoforms here deposited in the channel and you can see that even though there's a channel body that maybe looks something like this and that that's maybe you know uh, one Irina tall and she's she's fairly tall I think she's about six feet I think she's taller than I am uh, 
you can see, so that may be a two meter t thick deposit, but you don't actually see any clinoforms that were actually that two meters tall. So this may be the thickest that that clinoform ever got, telling you that maybe that was about the maximum flow depth, more or less, of the channel, and that this channel was super elevating, right? It might have been uh, aggrading through time and building out these wing deposits here, these these levy uh, these levy deposits um, out on top of this floodplain here. Okay, this is that scoured base, right, that indicates that when the channel arrived there, at some point it eroded out some of that floodplain, right, uh, and, 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 and then started to fill in over time, okay. <clears throat> These are some amazing deposits. I really want to go out there at some point to the Ebro Basin in Spain. They're, they're incredible. Uh, here's some other examples, again, from the uh, Ebro Basin, uh, again, from Irina uh, Overeem, she's a professor at University of Colorado, by the way, uh, here showing sort of one of these channel body composite features here that may be made up of amalgamations of, of different uh, generations of this channel that filled in, and maybe that you could see point bar stratigraphy in there or not, depending. You can see that scoured base really nicely here, and then you can see these these wings that may have filled out over onto the floodplain as as the sort of levee, as you got crevasse splays and so forth. Okay, so this is a fairly characteristic, especially in systems where you have a high degree of, of floodplain deposition. So these get isolated in the in those muddy uh, sequences here. Okay, and again going back to that. Uh, image that we had seen previously is very much the same kind of situation. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a, a close-up of what the internal stratigraphy of this looks like to tell you whether the core of this has multiple generations of channels, and we call those multiple generations stories. Okay, uh, so this this term story refers to the different stories of or levels of uh, uh, bar deposits that you might see amalgamated together to build that channel body, okay? Um, and so as a river meanders across its floodplain, we've kind of talked a little bit about this, but you would start to be able to build a facies, identif or a, a facies succession as a function of the fact that we kind of understand the processes that are going on in the deepest part of the channel and then the next deepest part as you go up and up and up the bar you start to get different uh, deposits associated with that. So as this thalweg migrates across the channel, the first thing that happens is you get erosion, right? The erosion at the edge or at the margin of this channel uh, results in a scour, okay? So you have floodplain here, and the base of this channel scours out that floodplain. So that's indicated here on the facies diagram, right? So you've eroded it out. You may get uneven or irregular scour. You might see things like rip-ups, so chunks of mud. Uh, yeah, it may look just like the floodplain deposits that you're eroding into clasts of mud that were eroded from that floodplain then deposited right above it in this erosional channel. You'll often see a lag gravel. Um, so that lag gravel may include actual you know, uh, lithified gravel chunks but also it may include those mud pebbles um, over immediately over that uh, erosional bank. And then that will grade or fine upwards into those cross-bedded sands, often trough cross-bedded, right? Um, indicating that you're in the main part of the channel with the, the dunes migrating through there and the main you know, sediment transporting phenomenon are occurring. And then as you move up the bar, right, as the bar starts to migrate towards your location in the landscape, right, say you, we're, we're, we're tracking here, for example, as the river's migrating this way, uh, then you get sort of finer uh, trough cross beds or ripples. Uh, you might get uh, planar cross beds and so forth up in here. And and those eventually fine upwards into silts as you get towards the top of the bar um, where you get into sort of deposits that might be left behind as a flow is receding, uh, as a flood wanes, you might get those uh, 
uh, you, you end up with uh, um, climbing ripples. Those climbing ripples are fairly common as flow recedes and sediment is coming out of suspension. And so the bed forms are aggrading faster than they're migrating. Uh, and then you get up into the floodplain deposits as that migrates even further and as the, the channel moves away from you, essentially. And in these, you may end up with, uh, you know, floodplain deposits are typically fine grain materials. You might see things like mud cracks indicating subaerial exposure, right? We probably talked about desiccation or mud cracks. Um, you might get roots, uh, root casts. Uh, you may see uh, crevasse splay or, or overbank flood deposits in the uh, in the floodplain deposits as as that uh, channel migrates away as well. So you might get, you know, thin thin little sandy deposits that just kind of come in and then are gone as you go up the section. Okay, so so that's kind of how you would think about building, say, a, a, a facies model for a meandering river. And that can kind of help you distinguish from a, a braided river in a sense where you can see in this case you have much more uh, floodplain deposition, uh, much more fine material preserved. The, the fining upward sequence is much more pronounced typically uh, and, and, and that might indicate that you're in one of these more mixed grain size, stable floodplain, muddier floodplain systems that, that is characteristic of a meandering river like this. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for rivers uh, for the week. I, I realized that this week was two, two relatively long lectures, um, but certainly no more contact hour than a normal week would be under non-pandemic times. So. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with one image of, <laughs> this may be my favorite meandering river in the solar system. This is an image from uh, Mars. And, and you can see these are uh, uh, stratigraphy preserved from you know, three point something billion year old uh, ancient meandering rivers. You can see the, the scroll bars. You can see a, a, a shoot cutoff that occurred here, right? So as this meander maybe grew this might have cut off at some point uh and and, and so on so uh I, I love these kinds of deposits they're amazing and i i can't wait to see what uh what the river and delta stratigraphy looks like from the lander that just arrived there um, so that wraps it up for this week's lectures uh next week we will move downstream even further and start talking a little bit about deltas and, and how they vary and differ from from say fans and rivers so Alrighty.